Hello and welcome. We're just going to give a moment for everybody to join us. Welcome. We're getting to critical mass. So give us one more moment. We'll start in just one minute. Wonderful, welcome. Hello everyone. My name is Catherine Lusk. I serve as co-director of the Boston University Initiative on Cities. On behalf of our team, as well as the BU Arts Initiative and BU Diversity and Inclusion, it's a pleasure to host you today for telling the untold stories of civil rights leaders in Boston. This is the third event hosted this semester as part of our new series, Race, Place, and Space, which we created to understand the racialization of space and the spatialization of race in urban contexts. And perhaps most importantly, we're learning how the past shapes the present and how activism, community leadership, and storytelling are contributing to a more just future. I have the pleasure of welcoming today's speakers, and then I'll turn it over to them for the rest of the discussion. First, we're joined by Paula Austin, an assistant professor of history and African-American studies at Boston University, who writes and teaches about Black visual culture, African-American and civil rights history, and is the author of Coming of Age in Jim Crow DC, Navigating the Politics of Everyday Life. Paul is both a presenter and our facilitator today. Next, we welcome Roberto Mighty, a multimedia artist, filmmaker, photographer, sound designer, and musician, and alumnus of Boston University. He's a, the writer, producer, and director of the film Legacy of Love, an exploration into the relationship between Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. Finally, we welcome Jesse Rubenstein, an exhibition designer and lecturer in art and graphic design at Boston University, whose students have been creating visual exhibits about the life of Sue Bailey Thurman and Howard Thurman and the Thurman Love Ethic. A quick reminder for those of you, I, I'm sure many of you have been on Zoom before, but if you haven't, we'll take questions via the Q&A function, and those will be visible to, um, to Paula and to all of our speakers today. We're gonna listen to them present and then um, enter into the discussion section of the format. And with that, thank you again for joining us. And I turn it over to you, Paula. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you, Initiative on Cities, for, for making this happen. I'm so excited to be here with Roberto and Jesse um, uh, and, and excited to share our projects uh, with you all. And um, so I will, because we only have until five and we have so much material that we wanna share with you and also spend some time talking a little bit about it with each other and with you all, I wanna immediately turn it over to Roberto. Thank you for being with us today, Roberto. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I am sharing my screen and I wanna immediately get right into my project, which was uh, a film about the relationship between um, Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King and their meeting in Boston. And let me start out by saying that I went to school, as was earlier, I was outed as a BU alumnus. Uh, I went to college in Boston about hundred years ago. <laughs> and uh, and um, I remember being very excited intellectually to be in college. I remember being very excited to, um, I was you know pretty young. I remember being excited to meet um, people from all over the country and particularly excited to think about dating in a very real way. And I think that even though I was younger um, than the uh, Coretta Scott and Martin Luther King Jr. were, they entered as graduate students. There's something I felt I could identify with about that experience of being totally away from home and being out and about being stimulated in so many ways, including romantically so I was surprised, however, to find out a few, quite a few things in working on the film. It was about a two year project. One of the things I found out was that um, Coretta Scott had a tremendous impact on Martin Luther King Jr. in terms of her progressive left-leaning politics. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But first I wanna to get to this. Um, in most major metropolitan cities around the country, 
by the time, by 1951, the time that uh, Coretta and Martin came to Boston, there were already people in those cities, including Boston, working on the big issues of the day in civil rights. And that's what I want to talk about. So my film is about, you know, the meeting of Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott in 1950s Boston when they met his students, fell in love and so forth. But what I found out in the course of the making of the film was that Boston already had had these very dedicated activists. Um, the activists were addressing serious issues of the day, including redlining and housing, school segregation, um, poverty, lack of job opportunities and economic discrimination. Do any of those issues sound familiar? <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, some of the leaders that were already here on the ground working were social workers, Otto and Muriel Snowden, who along with Melania Cass founded Freedom House in Roxbury, um, which is an institution that exists to this day. Um, it's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, a gentleman named Clarence Jones, who was, um, his nickname was Jeep Jones, um, was active in the 50s and, and early 60s. And he wanted to become um, Boston's first uh, or Afri first African-American deputy mayor. Does that sound familiar as well, right? Um, Elma Lewis, of course, founded the Elma Lewis School for Fine Arts in uh, 1950. Um, other leaders included Ruth Batson, Gil Caldwell, Mel King, Clarence Elam, Virgil Wood, um, and so on. You know, these are people who were legends in their own time in Boston, already on the ground working on the civil rights movement. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is because when I began exploring what was happening with the Kings, um, I should say King and Scott, um, here in Boston, people were eager to talk about their experiences with them, but also they really wanted me to know that we, uh, Boston had its own people who were really working hard on those issues too. Uh, I was thrilled in this film project to work with uh, Reverend Liz Walker, who is a legend um, in Boston. She's, uh, she's a reverend now, but prior to that, she was an award-winning um, journalist, television journalist, um, anchor woman, um, and then became an activist went overseas and did a tremendous amount of work in Africa and uh, now is um, pastor of a church right here in Roxbury. Um, I just wanna say this, for any of you out there who are thinking of making historical films, don't, um, don't delay. Uh, in the course, between the time that I began working on this project and the time that it came around for its second airing on WGBH television, um, two key, people who had met Dr. King um, and worked with him and had went on to become very, again, very active here in Boston, have passed away. That's Reverend Michael Haynes and Professor Herman Hemingway. Um, these are two pillars of our own civil rights community here in Boston. They're, and they're no longer with us. Um, many of the people that I sought out around the country, I worked with about 100 people around the country to get this film made. Many of them were quite elderly. And uh, I'd say, again, if you're thinking about making some kind of film or some kind of project where you, where you need to interview, pe interview people, um, get on it, you know, don't wait. Uh, that's me with my, uh, <laughs> my little toy there. Uh, that's a little behind the scenes. Um, and that's a quick overview of the film project as it pertains to today's topic, which is taking a look at you know, some of the people and some of the issues that were around in the 1950s and 60s in Boston, and that unfortunately are still around to this day. So I wanna make a quick word um, about, uh, I'm, just, I'm gonna sort of stop sharing my screen as well, just for a moment. Um, just like to say a, a quick word about uh, Coretta Scott. Coretta Scott grew up in Alabama in a very small town. Um, she was in a sharecropping uh, um, community and she herself picked cotton as a child. I was pretty shocked to hear that. And I found this out as I was working on the film. And um, she went off, she had an opportunity. She was very, very bright, you know, did very well in school. She went off to, uh, um, to college, Antioch in Ohio 
And there she came under the sway of progressive thinking um, academics and also her peers. By the time she got to Boston for graduate school in music at the New England Conservatory, she was a deeply steeped in uh, what we would now call leftist ideology. And uh, I'll just leave you with this cool story. When Martin, uh, she and Martin met, um, he, she, he said that he really thought that they could be like husband and wife on their first date, he said this, right? And uh, she said, well, I need you to read a book about socialism. <laughs> and she gave that book to him. And uh, more of that to be said, I'm really thrilled to announce here that um, my film Legacy of Love will be distributed nationwide on public television um, beginning next year. So um, people will all have a chance to see it all around the country. And uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And congratulations. That's amazing. Um, and thank you for sharing the not just legacy of love, the legacy of activism. And so many people do not know that uh, Coretta Scott was actually the, mo the more radical of the, the two in terms of ideology. So I absolutely want to come back to that um, when we get to the Q&A. Jesse, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Roberto, for sharing as well. Um, my name is Jesse Rubenstein, and I'm an exhibit designer and lecturer uh, in graphic design. And um, my practice often works on projects that support community practice and demonstrate um, the many layers that narratives end up having. It doesn't seek to provide a tidy, neat narrative, but it seeks to reveal and demonstrate that history is it's not um, clean and laid out and tidy. Um, it's actually complex and overlapping and overlaid. And um, I'm here to share work that my students have been working on this semester. And I'm also here because of a partnership that Paula and Austin and I had last year. We met for a project she had been, she curated and developed with her students called Writing Black Lives. And it was scheduled to open March, 2020. Uh, I think we all know what happened to that. Um, but it was through this work that I developed that I discovered the incredible resource that is the Gottlieb Archive at BU. Um, the civil rights collection at the Gottlieb runs deep. Uh, it had, they house Martin Luther King Jr.'s papers, the papers of Howard and Sue Bailey Thurman, um, not to mention countless other um, activists and celebrities. Um, it's an incredible resource at BU. So, Fall 2020, I was preparing to teach exhibition design. And often when I teach exhibition design, I like to incorporate experiential learning projects. Um, I think designing concepts is fun um, and it's easy to some extent, but I think when things become real, um, they, become, they become hard. Reality is hard. <laughs> and it allows students to be able to see how complex and layered and nuanced um, history is. So, um, I decided I wanted to work with the archive, particularly as a response to our current moment in time, the crisis of fake news, uh, the acceleration of racially motivated violence and the isolation caused by the pandemic. So I began exploring the collection and to be honest, I did not have to do much more than scratch the surface to find the wisdom, the light and the love that were the Thurmans. Um, the Gottlieb houses a searchable audio database of Howard Thurman's sermons. And uh, the Sue Bailey Thurman collection is a bit denser to navigate online, but listed on her page was a weaving. Um, and so much of my practice, I've been very interested in the metaphor of weaving as a way to discuss mutual exchange and community building. The structure of weaving relies on two opposing threads and you must have tension for a cloth to have structure. Weaving integrates opposing forces while maintaining the integrity of the individual. So the weaving listed on the Sue Bailey Thurman page is not any weaving. It was a cloth that Gandhi wove and gave to the Thurmans as a gift. The cloth, or it's also known as khadi, was a symbol of Indian independence over colonial British rule. And Gandhi believed that if Indians could produce their own cloth, then they would not be reliant on British textiles. And there are obvious overlaps here with the American slave trade and the production of cotton here in the States. In 1936, Howard and Sue Bailey Thurman met with Gandhi as part of the pilgrimage of friendship in the first African-American delegation to India, Burma, and Ceylon, sponsored by the World Christian Student Federation and the Student Christian Movement of India and the US. While in India, in addition to Gandhi, Thurman met with Rabindranath Tagore and Kashiti Mohan Sen. 
So I um, had this wonderful story I discovered, but the archive is closed because of the pandemic and research is greatly limited. So I needed to find a way to work with the object uh, and it would allow the students to be able to experience the archive, even though we were gonna be working remotely. So I wrote and was awarded a grant, a diversity and inclusion catalyst grant to have the object digitized. Um, to support a scholar for the research and also to fund student materials so they could make something at the end. Um, I enlisted Tony Pepe Dan, who is the assistant professor of photography, at the School for Visual Arts, and she photographed the cloth. And Gus Wheeler created a behind the scenes demo video um, created of the work. Um, I love this image of the photo shoot as we're there that you have like the great icon and the portrait behind, and you have the photo of Tony Pepe shooting the Gandhi cloth. Um, and I was, it's always an extreme privilege to be able to be in an archive and be with original archival material. And this was very much that, um, particularly during a pandemic. Um, also, as a result of this, I contacted the Thurman Center at BU and they connected me with Arlay Prelo, who is a documentary filmmaker. Uh, and she developed the Psalm of Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman. And um, Arlay met with myself and the students throughout the course of the semester, providing uh, historical guidance, spiritual guidance, mentoring. She, when we got off track, when students made generalizations or tried to connect dots that maybe weren't there, she gently corrected us, moved them in a direction. They, she was a great force of encouragement when students' work was beginning to gel. And from the start of the project, she was very active in saying to me and to the students, it's really important and critical that you find your own voice and you bring yourself to it. Um, and I'm very grateful for this collaboration. I think that's something to be said about the work based in peace is that you can't go it alone. Um, so getting into the student work, uh, we're entitling our work, Me, We, Projects on Peace. It's a group exhibition composed of a series of collaborative projects, each exploring active peacemaking through a different lens and rooted in historical and contemporary examples of community building. And it's centered around the stories of Howard Thurman and Sue Bailey Thurman's love ethic, and also the dedication Sue Bailey Thurman had for documenting black history. Um, Howard Thurman is more well known in Boston, but for those of you who are not as familiar with him, he is an author, philosopher, minister, educator. He was often called the backbench of the civil rights movement. He wasn't on the front lines. He felt that the, the most important thing was for an individual to really understand and connect with one's own individual spirit and that that carried out through to community. Um, on the On Being podcast by uh, Tipa, Chris, uh, Krista Tippett, she interviewed Reverend Otis Moss, who described uh, Howard Thurman in this way. He said he was a teacher, he was a mentor, he was the spiritual sage. He was not the one who was on the front line, but he was the one where people would retreat to to be filled. And that emphasis he had on the connection between interior life, inner life, and outer action was part of what was most revolutionary and part of what was so powerful. Uh, Arle also spoke to this reservoir that Howard Thurman created and that the Thurmans created together uh, in pre-civil rights Boston in the 50s when they were here. Sue Bailey Thurman is a, not as much of a household name as her husband, uh, but she is a powerhouse in her own right. Uh, she's an author, lecturer, historian, and organizational leader. She was renowned for her advocacy of interracial and intercultural international understanding. And she traveled around the world in pursuit of her vision of international peace and fellowship. Um, and this is an image that we revisited many times during the semester to reflect back on, and it is when Howard Thurman was anointed uh, the uh, dean of the dean and minister at Marsh Chapel. And uh, just you look at the the, the love that's in their eyes. Uh, you know, this was 1953 pre civil rights. It had to be hard <laughs> for them to be at a predominantly white institution, and you just you see the way they look at each other, and you just have the sense that like they you know they're saying like I got you, I, I have you here, and I think you know it's that that love ethic that really carried them through. So we had 13 short weeks <laughs> to work with this really deep, rich material, which is always the it's a blessing and a curse of exhibition design that you can dip in and skim, try to skim the surface and make connections and pull things together, but still recognize that history is layered and complex. Um, I worked with two groups of students. We met one time a week for three hours. 
One class met on Wednesday and was, was predominantly undergraduate students, mostly from uh, the School of Fine Arts, but then also we had some um, art and architectural history students. Uh, the second section, um, this was actually, this was our kickoff meeting where we met with Ryan Hendrickson and Sean Noel from the Gottlieb Archive and um, an RLA as well. And then we also had a weaving workshop where we investigated the structure of weaving and this is the Wednesday class. Um, students had kind of, I asked them to think about in retrospect, what one big thing that motivated them through their work. Um, what I did is I combined them, I mixed them up and I put them into groups and I asked them to work collaboratively, but I asked for them to find their own way through the material, to work in whatever medium they were comfortable working in, um, to figure out what assets each one of them had to share with the team. And these are some of the things that they said about their motivations. Uh, it was about, this work was about raising voices, sharing stories, sharing black women's stories, the idea that empowered women empower women, in search of a knowledge exchange that is mutual, the idea that all interactions are rooted in love or should be rooted in love, the importance of nurturing and hospitality, encourage people to think from other perspectives and to tell a more diverse narrative. There are many ways of being an activist. You don't have to be spectacular to be celebrated, though the Thurman certainly were spectacular. Uh, these were the objects that we investigated, the cloth, but then also as we were about to do the photo shoot, one of the students discovered an amazing object, artifact, archive in its own right, the historical cookbook of the American Negro. And this is a book that Sue Bailey Thurman um, compiled and published in 1958. And in it, she interwove um, Black history throughout the cookbook because at that time, there wasn't a market for Black history. It had to be packaged in the form of a cookbook. Um, and I will read to you very briefly um, what, she, what she says in the foreword. It's really beautiful. It's she, she starts the piece, uh, the cookbook by saying, how do you tell the story of a miracle? How do you touch the fabric of a dream? It is done when an organization goes in search of hidden treasures into attics and basements and boxes and chests pulling out old relics of social, economic, and political history affecting a family, a nation, or a people. And then she goes on to say, we have honored the great spirits of the past as though they were alive. Heroes and heroines now, now living are not included in this book except incidentally, and we hope the public must wait a long, long time before their names appear in future editions. Those included were selected as symbols of the past who sought only to preserve the life of the future, knowing that the future must be guaranteed in the present. We are their future. I think that's so beautiful. Um, so this was the material the students had to work with. And I'm gonna jump in and show you some of their projects. Um, this is a quote coming out of the cookbook as well. Along. So one group, they all developed different, different types of projects. One group um, developed an exhibition that was cited at the Stone Gallery at BU, but it, it was intended to be a virtual exhibition only experienced online. And this exhibition explores the action process of thinking love and they follow, follows the lives of Howard Thurman, Sue Bailey Thurman, Mahatma Gandhi and their efforts to foster belonging and community rooted in love. While being guided by woven paths around the space, the viewers introduced to each figure's values and philosophies, significant life events and sites of overlap in their narratives. The three storylines intersect visually and meet at the pilgrimage of friendship to highlight a key site of exchange of knowledge between Gandhi and the Thurmans. The second half of the exhibit is dedicated to the ripple effect of this interaction as it applies and manifests to different stages in each figure's life. And it concludes with an opportunity to connect these themes to contemporary context, both broad and personal. Another project, which I'm gonna briefly click online. Um, all these are on, work in progress, I should say. The students are presenting them on Friday and next Wednesday to the Museum of African-American History at the end of the semester. So this is an online exhibition and I'm, I'm not gonna take the time to read through all of it, um, but it, what it does is it positions some of Howard Thurman's um, language and sermons uh, alongside excerpts from some of Gandhi's as well. And it creates uh, what is called fringes an audio visualization constructed conversation. I'm gonna play two minutes of it for you here because it's really powerful to hear the voices and to see kind of to see the space that it takes up. It's like I mentioned, it's two minutes. This realization is preceded by an immovable face. He who would in his own person taste the fact of God's presence can do so by a living face. And since face itself 
cannot be proved by extraneous evidence. The safest course is to believe in the moral government of the world and therefore in the supremacy of the moral law, the law of truth and love. We go along together with those who walk the way with us, bound to us by ties of affection or responsibility or duty, and sometimes destiny. But there comes a moment when I must take to my heel alone. And maybe that for a long time, the only, the only thing that I can manage and the thing that may be best for me is the secondary experience. But soon or late, if I am to be responsible, I must see it with my own eye. May be positive and creative, or it may be positive and destructive. It, it is very confusing. I confess that I have no argument to convince through reason. Faith transcends reason. All I can advise is not to attempt the impossible. Another group of students, I had two students who both were located in um, China. They couldn't get back into the States. And so I ended up partnering them up together because the time zone worked well for them to work together. Um, and they created a kinetic sculpture, a light sculpture um, that moves and is very beautiful. I'll click through briefly here too, so you can see their work. And they, were, they took some of their own inspiration. This is from um, a show called American Gods. I'm not familiar with it. Um, I could not decide whether I was looking at the moon the size of a dollar, a foot above my head, or whether I was looking at the moon the size of the Pacific Ocean, many thousand miles away, nor whether there was any difference between the two ideas. Perhaps it was all a matter of the way that you looked at it. And then you click through. As I said, these are still work in progress. And you enter two light installations. Uh, things develop and our understanding is diverse. We are experiencing the world and giving different interpretations. We think from other people's points of view. All we have to believe in is with our senses, the tools to use to perceive the world, our sight, our touch, our memory. And I'll briefly show you this one. This is a, a sculptural, an, an untitled an kinetic sculpture. I didn't name this art, artwork. It is what you think it is. back um another project this is a project that is um it's been designed and it's going to be created and installed in uh 808 com um, commonwealth hallway which is adjacent to the thurman center and also the building houses uh college for fine arts uh, school for visual arts and also the school for gastronomy and these students were really inspired and taken and moved with the cookbook. And so what they've created is almost a continuation, a living memorial of the figures who were um, introduced in the cookbook, but then they also included um, the names of um, black women leaders who have been active to today. So um, it includes Alice Dunnigan, Daisy Bates, Wilma Rudolph, Amelia Boynton Robinson, Marsha P. Johnson, Mae Jemison, Alexa Kennedy, Dorothy Height, Kamala Harris. And um, the work is, it's really, as I mentioned, it's a, very much a living memorial. It's a collaborative painting the students are working on together. And they're also creating a digital index that will live online, which will include brief biographies and photographs um, of the women. And the, the piece is meant to be somewhat site specific. There in the space, there are these light fixtures that are woven and the lines in the artwork respond to that, um, to the visual of that. And they also include vines and branches and blossoms um, that are apple blossoms, that, which is the Arkansas state flower, which is where Sue Bailey Thurman is from. And the other thing that's really interesting about this piece is that, as I mentioned, in this building houses the School of Gastronomy, the Howard Thurman Center, and the School for Visual Arts. And this piece really is just a beautiful manifestation of the coming together of the inhabitants of this building, um, as well as being a beautiful tribute. 
This is some of their work in progress. Um, another group is doing another exhibition. They're creating a physical model and they have um, a long exhibition script, which focuses, it's, it's cited, again, it's a conceptual project, but they cited it next to the Thurman Center. And the Thurman Center is known as the, the living room of Boston University. And they're thinking of this as the salon or tea room of Boston University. Sue Bailey Thurman was well known for her tea. And it would be as if Sue Bailey Thurman had invited some of these other women, American women change makers, who found activism and change making through their own means, um, through their art, through protest, through boycott. Um, and they also are interested in interweaving poetry, particularly from Langston Hughes uh, through this space as well. And then wrapping up, we have um, one final installation, which is composed of uh, an interactive timeline online, which combines Sue Bailey Thurman's timeline, along with civil rights history, and again, more poetry. And then it also has a physical manifestation. It's also going to be installed in this hallway. Um, in a similar space, in a conjoined space. And this is a string installation that encourages the BU community to think about race and activism in their own lives. Um, and so this is our series of projects. What comes next is that we're pulling the work together to be shown in the hallway as an exhibition that will be up through the summer and come down in the fall. And we are also working to get all this work onto a website. Um, and the website will include the behind the scenes video. It'll include a series of object installations the students did and all of their individual projects. Um, so I will stop sharing here as well, but thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jesse. And yes, Jesse mentioned that we met working on the Writing Black Lives exhibit, which uh, never came fully to fruition. Uh, if anyone was at uh, Carrie Greenwich's recent um, presentation, uh, you would have seen some of the William Monroe Trotter's Boston Guardian material that we were going to use for it. Um, so I will uh, share a little bit about the project that my um, uh, History uh, 112, African American 112 class, which was the intro to Black Studies, the history of the Black Power Movement, worked on last fall. We worked with uh, archival materials also from the Howard Gottlieb um, Research Center. Also, thank you to Ryan Hendrickson for pulling together those, uh, for curating those sources for us. Um, and we were specifically looking at uh, the Black Power era, understanding that it was much more inclusive of a uh, much more than racial justice activism um, uh, and Black student activism on BU's campus, but it what we found was that it included um, the struggle that BU students engaged in uh, to get uh, African-American studies program and center to expand uh, curricular offerings and uh, to develop ethical relationships with Boston, uh, with the Boston Black community. They proposed something like a talent bank. Um, they also did a lot of advocacy um, uh, in terms of wanting to make sure, so this is, uh, this is the, um, articles about the occupation of the um, of uh, the administration building in 1968 in April, uh, two weeks after or at the end of April uh, after the assassination of um, of uh, Martin Luther King. And actually, I will read you a little bit from the uh, letter that BU's Black Student Organization Umoja delivered to um, President uh, Arlen Christian or on April 15, 1968, about 10 days before they occupied the building. Um, and here is what they said. And I'll actually, um, there is a, we've got a really good image of uh, students occupying the building that I will take you to. So this is, a, this is the timeline that we produced uh, of all of the artifacts that students looked at. Um, and I can talk more about this. Um, when we get to the Q&A. Uh, so the letter said, the tragic assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has sparked the dormant conscience of white America. The past two weeks have witnessed the hypocritical masochisms of the nation. We, the black students of Umoja, recognize the necessity of revealing the racism which resulted in Dr. King's death. Racism merely revealed and reviled is not enough. If white America generally and Boston University specifically 
is serious about excoriating this malevolent scourge, they must act in a creative remedial fashion. We have developed therefore a series of specific demands and there were nine uh, demands in total, um, specific demands and proposals which would make this predominantly white campus relevant and expand uh, relevant and responsive to the needs of black students. Furthermore, these proposals would diversify and expand the general intellectual scope of the university. We urge the immediate implementation of these mandates as a living memorial to Boston University's most courageous graduate, our gallant black brother, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and they occupied the, um, the building and um, were able to actually uh, secure um, probably half of the demands they had made. Of course, one of that, the most important one was the African-American uh, studies. Um, it was called the Martin Luther King Afro-American Center. And, um, and they also expanded uh, curricular offer offerings and um, increased black student and black faculty and staff and, and um, uh, students and faculty and staff of color on campus. Uh, the other thing they did, and so this comes through in the letter, um, this, these, there are, were a bunch of letters between uh, late 1969 and uh, well into 1970 that were really about um, trying to hold the university accountable in terms of um, uh, anti-discrimination policies about black workers on campus. And uh, so they spent a lot of time um, working with uh, the Afro-American Center and uh, the president's office to make sure that the case physical education center as, as it was being called then, which was being built, um, was employing um, black carpenters, black masons uh, and other folks uh, on that construction job. So I will um, stop there and, um, and uh, open it up so that we can have a discussion. So we do have some questions that have come through and I will um, share those out uh, to, to you all. Um, one of them asks about Mel King, Roberto. I thought maybe uh, you could share a little bit more about Mel King. Roberto, you're muted. As I was saying, <laughs> Mel King is a, Thankfully with us, I had the honor of meeting him and his family on more than one occasion in gathering research for my film. And um, what an amazing person. Uh, I think people now think of him as the first African-American to run city, you know, citywide for mayor of Boston. Um, but he's so much more than that. You know, he's, uh, he's very active in many spheres in the city. And I really encourage anyone interested in all this to, um, check into archives in general, of course, the Gottlieb Center, um, but also Northeastern University has a great archive. Freedom House um, in Roxbury has a great archive. And, um, you know, just snoop around. Uh, this Boston has an amazing history of activism and intellectual activity. Thank you. Welcome. Um, another question that we have is about um, the busing crisis uh, as we know it, and a question about its failure or success. Now, I often warn, if there are any of my students in the audience, I often warn about our, our how we've conceptualized failures and successes of campaigns or of movements, um, and, that, and to do a little bit of interrogation about how we identify failure and success. But I wondered, um, Roberto, if you wanted to, to speak to this at all. The question of, of whether or not the busing was successful or a failure or neither. <laughs> May I just, just pop in just really quickly and say that that is an enormous and huge important question. And I just don't think it can possibly be. Uh, and I think you, uh, Paul, you made a great lead into that. You know, it's a, that's a huge question. Just for the record, I came to Boston in 19, as a freshman at BU in 1972. Boston was, uh, was underway. And um, 
it has so many tentacles, you know, this question. I, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to punt over to uh, <laughs> anyone else wants to speak to it. Well, and I know that one of the folks that you profiled in your um, in the introductory remarks, Ruth Batson, is uh, is a really a leader in that movement. And there is some great uh, there's a great interview um, of her in the History Makers Oral History Project, which uh, BU Library has a subscription to. So um, folks can definitely take a look at that. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a big topic. <laughs> it resists, it's gonna resist uh, uh, any answer that is facile, um, you know, so I'm not gonna try it. <laughs> well, we have a question about medium, which I think is one of the things that we, when we were sort of first talking about putting this together is one of the things that kind of brought us all together. Um, and so the question asks, how do you think the medium in which people learn and view history impact how they understand it? And I would add, there's another question that is about um, Boston High School students uh, learning about this history. And so for, for either of you, for both of you to kind of talk a little bit about medium, since, since you all are the artists and I am, I am not, so I will be quiet. Why don't you go ahead, Jesse? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, well, I think it's critical to consider a medium. I think it's, I think for a long time, we've been presented with a form of history that you receive from academia, from your teachers, from these sanctioned forms. And it seems like that is democratizing more and more. I think there are a lot of conversations happening right now about exposing multi-layered narratives. So, um, so I think, yes, medium is important. I think when you can touch people at their senses, right? You connect with something that's really internal with them, with their spirit, and that's really impactful. I think also when they're able to do it in a shared space with others and then have conversations about it, I think that becomes even more impactful. However, you know, where are those, where is that happening? Is it happening in these big museums? Um, in Boston, I don't know, it's, that's also a tricky conversation, right? Um, I think again and again, right, the conversations are having more and more. I think, I personally think exhibition is a really beautiful space for dialogue and for conversation, for exposing many different viewpoints. Um, so that's kind of, that's the medium I'm drawn to. That's what I like to direct my students to. And I also think there are many different ways to engage with it. Um, you know, to become a curator, the traditional answer is that you needed to get an art history degree and to go through this traditional path. But I think that's breaking apart a little bit more. And there are many ways that people, people can find to engage through creating film, right? Through graphic design, um, through experimenting with audio. And I think just understanding that there are many different entry points into it and there are no right answers and searching for these platforms that are really do seem to be um, growing up, there really is a beautiful groundswell right, ha right now happening in our city and across the country, um, I think for exposing all these narratives. Well, as a filmmaker, I, I of course believe in the power of cinema. <laughs> However, that is in fact, um, you know, accessed of course nowadays, a lot of films are being accessed, you know, on phones and on screens like the one before you right now, right? Um, let me just say that about film, you, you know, um, it's so it can be incredibly powerful to look at stories that you didn't know about before. Uh, and I think one of the things that historical filmmakers or filmmakers who make history projects like mine, one, one of the things we try to do, number one, we try to get, we try to be accurate, you know? Um, generally for accuracy, we look to books, typically um, authors who are historians and academics tend to revere the facts. They don't always get them right per se, but they tend to, and we filmmakers often, that's our first line is to go right in and start reading a whole bunch. You know, that's certainly what I did with this project. But then of course, a film has another, another layer and that is to talk to living witnesses. Now, um, I am in fact, um, extremely passionate about this topic. Uh, I'm sure that most people watching this, participating in this, have a grandparent, you know, um, or had a grandparent at some point. And maybe um, that grandparent was full of stories. Um, and maybe 
you were lucky enough to hear some of those stories. Um, I think, I actually think that when a, an elderly person dies, it's like an entire library burning down to the ground. And um, this is so important that we interact with not only you know, elders who are involved in famous things, but just the people that are right in your family, right there. They know all sorts of things that, that we didn't, that we don't know. And very often um, they never get asked. I happen to be working on another project right now, a, a new television series for public television that is about aging. And one of the number one things I find is that people who are old, older than a certain age, like once they become seen as, seen as elderly, often they feel that people don't want to hear what they have to say. So my film wouldn't have gotten anywhere at all if I hadn't been able to actually interview people who had met and interacted with Dr. King and Coretta Scott King. I would have gone nowhere because otherwise, why not, why not just tell people to read the books, right? The other thing about film is that, in my opinion, film is a, is a great medium for getting across emotional things. Um, in my film, I really tried to, um, first of all, in my interviews to elicit not just the facts from people as they remember them, you know, and you know, that's the loaded point right there, right? <laughs> but, uh, but also to elicit from them how they felt about it at the time. Then also through my research, um, I also created historical reenactments, you know, that dramatize certain moments um, in these people's lives. And finally, um, I want to also encourage anyone who's watching, who's interested in filmmaking, um, to think about your own experience. Think about what's idiosyncratic about you that makes you passionate about this topic. Why are you spending all your time, in many cases money, <laughs> you know, learning about this topic, interviewing others, traveling around? Um, the very first interview for my film, I went straight from Boston to Berkeley, California and interviewed a woman who had dated Dr. King when she was a when he was a graduate student at BU and she was a freshman at Radcliffe. Why? Well, because I knew that she was getting on in years and I just felt it was incredibly important to get that story straight from her. Um, and any, histor any historical filmmaker does this. You know, they try to find the living witnesses um, to it. So I hope that explains uh, at least one point of view there. Yes, I mean, I, the thing I would add to it is about engagement. I'm thinking about kind of the complex historical narratives and, and uh, access to sort of feelings and interior thoughts and inner lives. And um, as the person probably who, you know, I'm, I work mostly with text, it's part of the reason why we do so much work in my courses with the primary sources, with mm -hmm. the actual, you know, things that were made at the moment of, you know, of the, the period that we're looking at to kind of get to some of that stuff um, that is sometimes, you know, is it, certainly not part of a lot of the kind of textbook um, histories of, of any places, really, right? They really are kind of doing th these broad overviews, and they're often, you know, very uh, sort of stark in terms of they don't have very much complexity or nuance, the layers that you were talking about, Jesse. So um, it's why we work so closely with uh, primary sources. And I want to do a better job thinking about medium, working with sources that are, you know, that are uh, music and art and, um, you know, f and film. I mean, we, we, when, um, when we're able to, we will, we will look at some Oscar Michaud, you know, some posters from the, so, I mean, I'm, I'm doing my best in terms of diversifying uh, the types of, of artifacts that, that we look at in the classroom. That's great. That's really great. Just want to just quickly add, I, I did a project at Harvard um, a few years back that was about uh, Puritans and Native Americans in the 17th century. Not a whole lot of um, primary source objects available from 1630, right? But I was able to find some incredible archivists at the British Museum in, of course, England. And what I found repeatedly is that archivists are way more passionate than I could ever even dream of being, right? <laughs> and they really, the funny thing is they, they really want to, they never get asked, like, do you happen to have, you know, I don't know, the Bible that such and so priest preached from in 1637 in Rhode Island? But yes, in fact, we do have that. Wow, could I look at it? Well, I could show it to you, you know, great. 
what time? How about Tuesday at two o'clock? I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, so Paul, I agree a hundred percent, like getting you know, into those primary sources and all that. Great. I mean, I blame my profession for that. Jesse, go ahead. No, I was just gonna, I was gonna third what, you're all, what you all are saying. I think often in working with exhibitions, my most favorite part is having the opportunity to go into the archive and work with a historian, because as you said, Roberta, they are so passionate and they know so much about whatever the topic is that you are into. And it's, I always feel like if I can try to capture some of that light and their voice yeah. and somehow communicate that and share that with others, then I have done my job. Um, and that is one of the most challenging things, right? Is being able to capture that and share it through the through primary sources, through audio, through interviews and layering all of it. So then the visitor finds their own way through it. Brilliant. But even, I mean, I think even though both of you talk about um, the chosen uh, forms that kind of allow for those, those complex and nuanced narratives, they are also confined, right? I mean, they're confined in terms of time, right? You still are making decisions um, for what you're going to kind of prioritize, what you're gonna highlight. Um, and so those decisions are all still being made. Um, and I wonder um, if you can talk a little bit about how you make those decisions, even though you have an intention for complexity and for nuance, um, I could you talk a little bit about the process for that? And and certainly, Jesse, in, in the case of working with students, how you help how you help students to to go through that process of, of in this intentional process. Sure, it's it's not easy, <laughs> right? I mean, because that's the other thing, right? Historians have this deep well of knowledge, and you have somebody walking through a museum exhibition, maybe with their grandmother, maybe with their child and they're walking and you don't have control. It's not a film. You don't have their attention for this linear period of time. And so what we talk about is, is doing just that, is layering the hierarchy, is thinking, okay, if somebody is walking through the space and they spend 10 minutes with this work, right? That we have spent three years <laughs> meticulously grooming and writing and editing and pulling out, um, what do they get away? What do they take away from it? And so there's that high level of information. And sometimes that comes through, right, through music, through big quotes on the wall, through those like big experiential sensory based experience. Um, and then we look at what's that next la layer. And that's probably how much I would spend with something, right? I'd sit, I'd watch something for a few minutes. And how do you communicate that? And then to the person who will read every single word on every single label, then the depth is for them. Right. And I always say that, like, you can't you can't touch everybody with this work and you won't and you can't try to. But if you can get that person walking through and if they get the one big thing um, that you're trying to get across through your work, then you've been successful. Um, and then if you've provided enough resources for the person who wants to spend four hours with it, then that's also beautiful. Um, I think the Internet provides a great opportunity for people to layer experience and connect back to work in a deeper level. Um, but I also think, you know, it is, I always feel this loss at the end of a project that it's, you know, that you can only go so deep with the work. Um, and that's right. That's what lifetime is. And you just spend your lifetime layering the projects and layering the projects. Um, but that, that, that's kind of my answer to that question, how you deal with, with the priorities. Oh, I guess the last thing I'll say, lost my thought for a second, is that with students, what I have continued to ask them over and over again is what their one big thing is, right? Like, Okay, you have this timeline and it has poetry and it has history and it has um, interaction, but like, why? <laughs> so what, right? So why are you doing it? Why are you spending the time that Roberto talked about, you know, the hours and the money and the thought and the energy, and it has to speak to that core mission inside of the, the artist. Uh, yeah, <laughs> agreed. I will say this, uh, the question is almost, uh, yeah. It's almost a trick question because there's, it's almost like physically painful to leave stuff out, isn't it? Like, come on, right? You know, and it's like just when you work on something for years, and then you have to leave out this fact or this point. You know, so that is, I mean, we are curators, whichever medium that we're in, you know, we are the curators of the information. But I also dare say that in exhibition and in filmmaking, you know, there are some similarities. And one of them is that. You know, if, the, if people just wanted to get the facts, they could just call me or they could just email me and I give them a list of the, all the books I've read. And I say, okay, just read those books. But what, 
you know, I am a filmmaker, right? And uh, Jesse, you're an exhibition, uh, you are a multimedia artist. And so, you know, we have, by the way, there's a massive thunderstorm going. I live in the country, there's a massive thunderstorm going on. So that's the noise you hear. Um, but at any rate, um, yeah, so all the stuff, I feel that my job is to synthesize all the stuff from the months or years of research and then filter it through my idiosyncratic point of view. Because heck, I'm the person making the film, right? You know, this is my chance, you know? <laughs> so there's certain things that I want to get across. Now that is a different job than the job of the historian, you know, perhaps. Um, but I, I suspect it's similar in many ways to the job of the multimedia artist, you know, that's all this information and it's our job to again, filter it through. And as far as I'm concerned with the legacy of love, you know, some of the things I mentioned earlier, well, you know, there were two college students in love, totally. That's a, that's a lock for me. I experienced that. Um, they came to this Boston, which is in fact a beautiful city. It is a beautiful American city. Cool, all over that. You know, um, they dated in certain places that I went to, Symphony Hall, the Boston uh, Public Garden. Yeah, I've been to those places on dates, you know. And, but then more importantly, perhaps, um, there are all these issues of how they learn from their elders and how they learn from their peers and what intellectually they wanted to, what they took from their academic experiences and brought to their life mission, which was for civil rights, you know. so. You know, this is all very personal stuff. And I, yeah, I think that um, it's my job to kind of be myself interpreting or curating this stuff for people. So we have one final question um, and it comes from our own uh, Catherine Lusk and um, who is asking, is there a Bostonian whose story um, we want to tell someone that maybe folks don't really know a lot about? I will say that I will put two links in the chat for everyone, one that responds to the um, to the Latinx uh, Boston history question, and then one um, that responds a little bit to the question about, you know, pre 20th century uh, Boston history, there are some really good, um, there's some really good books, uh, including the one that is mentioned in the Q&A Black Bostonians by the, the, the amazing historian team, the Hortons. Um, and I will put another uh, book in the chat that, that is a, also a great 19th century reference. But I wonder, is there a, a, a parting story that, um, that either of you wanna share about uh, a, a not very well-known Bostonian? I think for me, it's, it's much less individual and group. Um, it, it's the, there are student activists um, who I really focused on in the project that in my class did. But yes, is there is there an individual? Sure. I mean, my my answer is pretty easy and quick. It's Sue Bailey Thurman. I feel like I've just <laughs> scratched the surface in November of this work, and there's a lot there to dig into. Um, I think she was very much ahead of her time. I really appreciate the way that she had made room for community and inclusion and people coming together. And again, just the passion she had for documenting his documenting history. Um, there's a story of her walking through Beacon Hill with her daughter um, and designating some of the sites along the Freedom Trail. And you know, that's that's an amazing image to have, especially knowing Beacon Hill, right? And Boston. And again, thinking about how groundbreaking she was. Um, so Sue Bailey Thurman is my answer. That's great. Uh, I would say there's so many, and just right on the spot, I'd say Reverend Michael Haynes, um, you know, who was pastor of the 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury for many, many, many years, worked with Dr. King, and which was, um, you know, very high profile stuff, but then sort of went on to just continue working, you know, day in, day out, week in, week out, um, you know, on all the stuff on the ground, all the nitty gritty details of helping to, um, bring communities together, but also more importantly, to help develop the African-American communities um, that were in, that are, and were in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan. He's one person who, uh, unfortunately, again, he's no longer with us, but he's someone that we can learn more about. And I would add uh, William Monroe Trotter, who is really, right, the precursor to, I mean, sort of in between those 
uh, late 19th century uh, political activists in uh, Race Over Party, which is the book that put into the chat in, and uh, the, that uh, generation that, that you started us off with, Roberto, who was incredibly uh, radical and uh, editor for the Boston Guardian. Um, uh, so yes, and I guess on that note, I will uh, thank you all for, for being here with us today. Uh, Roberto and Jesse, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you Initiative on Cities for hosting it. And thank you everyone for, for hanging out with us for an hour. I hope I get to see people in three dimensions sometime very soon.